I'm Dr. Jason Fung. Today we're going to talk about Ozempic, the weight loss drug that's sweeping North America, and how it works and what implications it has for weight loss. And it's coming right up. Ozempic, which is the drug known as semaglutide, is part of a drug class called the GLP-1 agonist group, meaning that it stimulates a hormone called the glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor, or GLP-1. And this drug class was initially discovered in the saliva of the Gila monster. This drug class was actually approved in 2005 by the FDA. And there was some modest weight loss, about five and a half pounds. So it wasn't great, but it was definitely there. Uh, next came liraglutide, which could be taken once a day. And again, it was easier and it did have a little bit of weight loss, um, but it was really only about eight to 10 pounds. So again, the drug companies continued to work on this molecule to make it even easier. So instead of a once a day injection, they created a once a week injection and that became semaglutide, which became Ozempic and at a higher dose is called Wagovi. The amount of weight loss was a bit of a revelation. In fact, the uh, step one study, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, showed that people could lose about 15% of their body weight and actually keep it off. So how does the drug work? Well there was really three main effects of this drug, none of which were really related to the insulin secretion that was initially thought to be uh, how it worked. One is that it caused satiation, which means that when you ate it made you full. One of the effects is of, of this drug is to delay gastric emptying. So the stomach normally holds your food and uh, mixes it up with stomach acid and then slowly releases it into the small intestines for digestion. If the stomach is very full, that is you've eaten a lot or the stomach simply isn't emptying, then you activate stretch receptors in the stomach and that tells your brain that, hey, you're full, you shouldn't be eating anymore. The second major effect is that it causes a tidy, which is the sensation of being full uh, and not feeling hunger. And here, the effect is mainly in the brain. The GLP-1 has receptors in the brain areas known uh, as the subfornical organ, which is along the third ventricle. And at that area, it has a very weak blood-brain barrier so that when your intestines release the GLP-1s, it can then act in the brain and it's not going to get blocked by that blood-brain barrier. And the third major effect is vomiting. So again, in the brain, there is a region called the area of postrema, and it's very, very dense in GLP-1 receptors. And when activated, it makes you vomit. So all three of these uh, sort of side effects, which is delayed gastric emptying, causing satiation, uh, increased uh, satiety due to the direct effects, and also vomiting, all of those would basically cause you to have uh, this effect of not wanting to eat. The number of people that had side effects on this drug, it was a rather stunning 89% of uh, people actually had side effects. So nausea had 44% in the treatment group versus 17% in the placebo. And this really explains a lot of the effect of uh, the drug. That is, if you're busy tossing your cookies, well, you're not going to think, oh, wow, this would be a great time to eat a little stinky blue cheese, for example. The instinct is to not eat. And when you don't eat, your body is going to use those sorts of calories that it has stored, which is glucose and body fat. So therefore, you see that it's a very good drug to reduce blood glucose for the treatment of type 2 diabetes and also for uh, obesity. And what we find is that people do, in fact... Uh, lower how much they eat by almost a thousand calories a day. 
and the effects are quite widespread. That is, it, there's, there's multiple effects. If you look at the number of daily meals that they take, like how often people are eating, it's down by about 0.6 meals per day. If you look at how often they snack, it's down by about 1.4 snacks per day. They also intended to increase their exercise and they changed the foods that they were eating. So if you're less hungry, then it's a lot easier to make those healthy choices. And you see this in this study that was done uh, in 2023, where they found that they ate a lot more fruits and veggies and chicken and fish and ate a lot less cookies, sugary drinks, and candy. And then really, no matter what diet you think is effective, that's a good switch. People also ate out a lot less, 63% overall, with a, a, a whopping 73% decrease in fast food visits. After all, why would you want to spend money eating out if you don't even feel like eating? Um, if you look across the macronutrients, that is the carbs, the proteins, and the fats, well, that's where you saw all of them decrease, but specifically in the carbohydrates the most, and also in the fat. So what does Ozempic really teach us about weight loss? Is it all about the calories? Is it just because of the calories? And the answer here is a definite no. You have to remember that there's lots of effects. There's decreased meal frequencies, decreased snacking, decreased carbohydrates, there's less eating out, less fast food. So you can't simply say that it's due to the less in calories. It could be any of those other effects. And you got to remember that Ozempic does not directly affect calorie intake. What it does is it controls the hunger, which then reduces the calories, which causes the weight loss. But because it controls the hunger, what you're doing is attacking the root cause of the problem. Because if you're really hungry and you simply eat fewer calories and you're still hungry, well, that's not a very sustainable situation because then you're hungry all the time. And when you're hungry, you're going to want to snack or you're going to eat more frequently or you're going to make those bad choices. So really Ozempic teaches us that it's really about controlling the hunger and not the calories. And we see this in other drugs too. You see this in nicotine, for example. Uh, it also is well known to reduce hunger. In fact, uh, studies going back hundreds of years have shown that uh, even native peoples had used uh, tobacco as a way to cut down the hunger pangs. When you smoked, you simply didn't want to eat as much and you see this effect in weight. Smokers, uh, current smokers weigh less than uh, former smokers and you can actually track that effect as they quit smoking their, their, their weight starts to go up because again it's about controlling the hunger which controls the calories. The question is then what controls hunger and some people think that hunger is really just about having no food in your stomach. That's not true it's actually a hormonal state. Because if you look at circadian studies of hunger, such as this one, for example, what you see is that um, in lots, when you take a lot of people and measure how the, the, the time of day that they are the most hungry, uh, it is 8 p.m. in the evening. If you look at the time that they are least hungry, it is 8 a.m. in the morning. Yet 8 a.m. is the time of the day where you have gone the longest without food because it's not about the food in your stomach, it's about the hormones, which are telling you whether you should be hungry or not. You gotta focus on the hormones. As I talk about in the obesity code, uh, weight, obesity is really a hormonal imbalance, not a calorie imbalance, because it's the hormones that controls the calories. That is, if you think your problem is that you're eating too many calories, the, the, the solution is not to say eat less calories. Just like if you're alcoholic, the solution is not to say just, well, drink less alcohol. If you think you're eating too many calories, which is leading to weight gain, then you must ask the question, why? Why are you eating too many calories? There are also many different uh, ways that you can activate these same receptors, the GLP-1s, and we're gonna get into those in a separate video. I hope you'll stick around. Thanks for watching.